Senator Marco Rubio stopped by the studio this week. We discussed a number of issues, from Venezuela to daylight savings time. We started, however, with President Trump's budget proposal, which allocated only $63 million towards Everglade restoration, instead of the $200 million the state had expected. Did the president betray Florida by not putting the money in? No, I think what happens is they come up with this budget and they want to get under a spending limit. And so in order to prioritize some things, you've got to make other budget line items less. I have a long list of projects, including the democracy program in Cuba, that have been cut. It doesn't mean that's where it's going to wind up. The problem with it is that under the earmarks rules that we now have, that's the ceiling. That's as high as we can go. So the only way we can supplement that 60, there's two things that need to happen. Ideally, the White House would amend their budget request and increase that number a little higher, maybe not the full 200 million, which we need, but higher. And then second is we can do something called additional funding for approved projects. That wouldn't be specifically delineated for the Everglades, but if we can get that number of additional funding high enough, a percentage of that will be for the Everglades and could get us close to or but at the 200 million. But wasn't this the argument that, that uh, Rick Scott made in running for the Senate and that DeSantis made in running for governor, that they have this close relationship with the president and they'll be able to help bring home these sort of dollars, exactly this sort of funding for the Everglades because of their relationship to the president, it does seem as if the president turned his back on them. Well, that's not the budget. In essence, that's not what's going to be funded. That is the president's proposed budget. Now the work of Congress, which has, as we discussed constitutionally, the power to appropriate, now it's up for Congress to step forward, make that happen, ensure we have the support of the administration to do two things, increase the number from 60 to something higher, but more importantly, openly advocate and push. Because if we turn over this money, uh, um, it's not earmarked to the Army Corps of Engineers. Let's say we turn over 300, you know, the number's 300. They then decide how much of that to apportion to different places. We want to see a significant percentage of that added on to the 60 or 70 billion so that we get to the full 200 that we need to get this moving forward. So the work now begins. We're going to get, you know, we're going to work real hard at the appropriations level in both the House and Senate. And I believe, and the White House has already expressed a willingness to work with us to get that number higher. But if the, the president disappointed on the funding for Everglades, restoration. Another promise that was made during the campaign season was to guarantee there be no offshore oil drilling in Florida, off the Atlantic coast, or off the Gulf Coast. The president is, is going to be announcing soon his plans as it relates to offshore oil drilling. Are you confident that he will come back with a plan that does not include offshore oil drilling in Florida, or are you concerned that there may be in there? I'm vigilant, obviously, because the Department of Interior and others weigh in on this situation, and I know that Senator Scott's involved in these conversations, and we are in the House delegation. It's a pretty strong consensus in, in our delegation that we don't want in Florida, including House and Senate members, Republicans and Democrats, that we want this, uh, the, the, the current limitations to be extended for a significant period of time. I have a bill that does it. And I should say we're vigilant, but I'm confident that at the end of this process, that consensus will be respected. But you're not confident that the president will, will say it in the coming No, weeks. I am. I'm, I'm just vigilant, obviously, because, again, when it gets down to that level, I mean, the notion that the president is personally involved in drawing that up, I mean, the agency is at Interior is going to play a big role in making that decision. So we will interact with the White House to make sure the word gets down that they don't want to see this at the front. I'd, I'd rather win that battle at the front end than at the back end, but we'll win it. Oil drilling in the Everglades, that's suddenly come up. Um, where do you stand on whether or not we should be drilling for oil in the Everglades? Look, I, there's existing exploration rights that people might have legal rights to, to do, and the courts will decide that. There's, uh, I don't know what the status of that court case is at this moment. There was some talk today that there might have been a mistake in the court ruling, somebody said. But that said, uh, that the court actually said it was a mistaken mm -hmm. ruling. But um, by and large, I'd prefer it not. And, 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 and I think that if, if, to the extent that there aren't existing leases there now, new ones should be scrutinized and perhaps not even necessary at this point. And, and if it in any way impedes the restoration work that we're working on, then I would be opposed to it. I, I am against anything that slows down Everglades restoration. We've begun to gain momentum. We've got to finish it. This is, we, we've got to do it now. We cannot afford a one or two year lull or any projects that get in the way of it. Staying with the environment for a section, the president also wants to cut funding for the EPA by more than 30 percent. His new pick to be the EPA administrator, Andrew Wheeler, has been cutting back on regulations, going to continue to cut back on regulations. Andrew Wheeler was a former coal lobbyist. Was he a good choice for EPA? Secretary? I think Andrew would do a good job. And I don't think the fact that you worked for an industry makes it impossible for you to be fair in the decisions that you make. Just because you're reducing regulations doesn't mean you're doing harm to the environment. It depends which ones you're eliminating. Over time, these, these regulations begin to stack up. Some do not make sense. Some do not have a 
cost-benefit analysis that justify them. But I think all of us, I would hope, share the goal of having clean water and clean air and dealing with anything. Look in Florida, the water issues are our number one state issue. They're economic, they're not just environmental. We've seen the impact of green, blue-green algae. We've seen red tide. We've seen the debates we're having now about releases from Lake Okeechobee and, and the management of that water and what it can mean to the future if, if there is uh, an overabundance of water that has to be released during the middle of the summer when there's algae in Lake Okeechobee. So my view of it is it depends on, I think you can reduce a significant amount of the regulatory uh, burden without without harming the environment so long as you're reducing the right ones and not ones that actually make a difference. Do you think cutting the budget by 30 percent is a good idea? Well, again, I'd have to see the details of the agency's budget, but I think all federal agencies, for the most part, could afford a diet in terms of how much they're spending. One of the issues you're going to be dealing with is the new uh, free trade agreement between the United States and Canada and Mexico. I know that last time we talked, late last year, you were disappointed in, in, in some of the uh, finer points of the deal, and you did not believe that Florida farmers came out well in the deal. Mine is, has it been modified? Are you still likely no, to vote? I mean, you seem to be leaning. You seem to be leaning against the deal without coming out against but it. But what's happened since then is we've worked with the administration and Ambassador Lighthizer, and they have now instituted an investigation on unfair trade practices, which was a holdup. They didn't want to do it. They thought it endangered the deal, but they are finally doing that investigation. There is no doubt that when that investigation is concluded, it will find that Florida growers are being dumped on, are being un, are being harmed by Mexican growers who are flooding the U.S. market with cheaper goods and knocking our folks out of business. And I'm going to tell you, if they knock out our growers, like in South Dade, that land will never go back to agriculture. It will be developed, and we will never get it back. And, uh, and we cannot lose our agricultural capacity. It's a key part of our state's so, uh, economy. So is the fact that that investigation is ongoing mean that you'll be voting for the NAFTA agreement? Or no, do you have to I mean, wait not to see alone, the results? Right, of course. Uh, but I'm confident of the results. But we want to see results. And, and, and the timeline, I should say, of that investigation should be in before there's any vote on this. Okay. But, but as it stands now, you would not vote for the NAFTA agreement? I would say this. I am not. I have my skepticism and my opposition to a deal that harms Florida growers has been pretty well expressed. I'm not here to deliver ultimatums. I think we're going to get a positive outcome from the investigation. I think there's a legal change in the law we want to make that allow our growers. It's complicated, but they themselves cannot bring complaints because it's got to be over 50 percent of the industry. And the California growers are growing. Right, it's not in about Mexico. dollars. It's not about subsidies or anything like that. No, no, it's no. It's more of a, more of an enforcement mechanism. Right. The, the Mexicans are flooding our market with cheap tomatoes and vegetables and knocking our guys out of business, we'll lose our agricultural capacity. So I'm not making any ultimatums about the trade deal, because by and large, I think having a trade deal with Mexico and Canada is good. But I will have a hard time supporting any deal that does not create fairness for our growers here in Florida. Let's turn to Venezuela. The president, we're typing this on Tuesday, the president held a press conference earlier today where he said that uh, he has not lost confidence in the ability to to unseat Maduro and that they, and that they haven't done some of the toughest sanctions yet. Are you worried, though, that the momentum seems to have been lost and they moved to oust Maduro? No, on the contrary. I, um, I think the momentum is only increasing, but perhaps in ways that aren't publicly visible. As an example, the only cash buyer that Venezuela, the regime has to generate cash for oil is India, a company named Reliant. And this administration pressured India, and we reached out to the embassy and talked to leaders. And last week, late last week, Reliant, an Indian company, announced we are not buying any more oil from Venezuela until sanctions against them are lifted by the U.S. They've just basically lost their, lost their only cash buyer. The oil they give Russia, China, and Cuba is in the case of Russia and China, it's to pay off debt. They don't get any money for it. The oil they give Cuba is in exchange for intelligence experts and other you know, repressive uh, tactics that the Cubans are providing them with. So you look at, and by the way, the sanctions that were imposed in January had a 30 to 60 day grace period, but the, the regime is running out of hard currency that they use to buy the loyalty, quote unquote, of those who hold Maduro in, in place. The, 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 the impact is only beginning to bite. There's an argument that is often made that says that by the U.S embracing so strongly to Guaido, that in fact it weakens Guaido because it, he, he then be, it can be seen as a puppet of the United States, which can strengthen Maduro's hand inside Venezuela. Yeah, but that assumes that there's a strong anti-American sentiment in Venezuela, which is just not accurate. I mean, Venezuela is a Western country. Uh, plenty of people in Venezuela have family living in the U.S. We're, we're ascribing Middle Eastern attributes to a Western country in the Western Hemisphere. That's the argument the Maduro regime people use, but it's not realistic. And number two, Juan Guaido is the interim president. President. He's already announced he's not even running for president. He is the president of the National Assembly, whose job it is to assume the presidency in a vacancy and transition the country to a free and fair election that would elect somebody else.
results. That's what we're supporting. We're supporting him and the institutions and the Constitution of Venezuela and the Venezuelans' people desire to transition peacefully to democracy. I want to give you a chance to respond to something. You've been criticized for some of the retweets and tweeting that you've done on the issue of Venezuela. People believe that you've, you've been retweeting some unverified information. For instance, the issue with regard to the Molotov cocktail that went into and burned one of the supply, um, supply tr tr trucks that was trying to get into Venezuela. The New York Times did an analysis, believed that it was not the Maduro regime which set the fire to it, but it was an Aaron Molotov cocktail thrown by protesters of the regime. You, is it concern you at all what no. you retweet? No. I mean, yeah, I don't retweet things that are not verified. The New York Times doesn't know what they're talking about. They analyzed 30 seconds of a video. You know who I relied on? The people who were there and the Colombian government. The Colombian government says it was them, and they had border agents there. New York Times is watching some video, 30 seconds of a much longer video. And by the way, the New York Times didn't say that they know that that wasn't. They just said that there's indications it may not have been. The other one was a, a retweet of an independent media outlet inside of Venezuela that the Miami Herald to criticize me has cited for what a great job they're doing so these are these are I, I don't I honestly people can write whatever they want I'm not into the whole attack the media thing but Maduro says that the US knocked out electricity by sending uh, drones that conducted an electromagnetic attack that's crazy. That's the things they should be focused on. But if they want to write about the tweets, they can. Daylight savings time. Is it, are we, should we stop moving the clock yes. front and well, back? Well, it was my bill last year. I was ahead of my time, no pun intended. And absolutely, it's, it makes no sense to continue to move back and forth. Frankly, I don't personally care which one of them it is. I like the one we're on now. But this moving back and forth makes no sense. It never really did. It makes unless no sense Unless you're farmers. Unless you're getting up in, in the morning and you need some the extra farmers sun. Aren't, farmers aren't asking for this. So I don't know. There's no, I mean, I mean it's not the most important issue confronting the republic. but. Um, you know, it's something we should do. The president supports it. We've got good bipartisan support. We've got some uh, some momentum on it. We'll see what happens. Uh, the move to sort of do away with the electoral college. I saw you you sort of spoke about this recently. Yeah. Some Democrats are talking about getting rid of the electoral college. It's not going to happen. Well, but it's also not a good idea because the one thing that the electoral college does is it requires somebody running for president to campaign across various parts of the country. Otherwise, you'll just have people campaigning in four states, and you'll have resectionalism and regional presidencies. And frankly, there are interests in the Midwest as an example where there are not a lot of people but a lot of the food we eat is grown there and so those interests you know in terms of having the variety and the distinction of our country just because the place doesn't have a lot of people doesn't mean that what happens in that state is not important to the health of our country. Does it feel inherently wrong though that whether you whether you're a Democrat or Republican does it feel inherently wrong that you can win the majority of the vote and still lose the electoral college? But that frankly is rare. It's, I no think no it's no but it's becoming more common. Well it's happened twice in the last it's happened in 2016 and 2000 and before before that, it happened three or four times in the previous centuries. This is not like it's happening every other election. It is, it is possible, but it is not common. Uh, it would happen in 2000 by a narrow margin, and then it happened again in 2016. And in between, we had multiple elections in which that was not the case. You've run for president, so you know what this process is like. First off, are you are you sort of sit back and as you watch the field of crowded Democrats sort of go in, sort of like smile to yourself and just sort of say, yeah, I know what that's like. I feel good right now. Yeah, I mean, part of it is obviously it's a lot of work. It can be very rewarding. But I think the most dramatic thing to watch is somebody's been out there in the public eye for years. You hardly heard anything about them. They launch and all of a sudden it's a two weeks of a string of stories about all the terrible things they've ever done. And people think this is great investigative reporting. Sometimes it is. A lot of time it's one of the other campaigns has packaged all this and is handing it to reporters. Now you can watch the full interview with Marco Rubio, including his take on the Democratic field. It's available at CBSMiami.com. Andrew Gillum up next on why he's not running for president.